Hello and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and joining me here in the Murrieta Studios is Dr. David Burns. Hi, David. Hi, Fabrice. Dr. David Burns has been a pioneer in the development of cognitive therapy, and he is the creator of the new team therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 20 languages. He is an emeritus adjunct clinical professor of psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Welcome to this episode of the Feeling Good podcast. And here we come with another Ask David. So, David, uh, here are a few questions from our listeners. You ready for the first one? Yep. So this is from Debbie, who says, can you use Team CBT to help people with medical disorders, such as Parkinsonism or cancer? Yeah, th this is one of my favorite areas, and you absolutely can. Team CBT or even the old traditional cognitive therapy before we had Team CBT, this was always my favorite uh, area of cl clinically. Well, that and shyness are probably my two social anxiety or my two favorite things to, to, to treat. And one of the reasons that I like treating people whose depression comes on in the context of a medical problem is, is because they're, they're exceptionally easy, easy to treat. And one of the reasons for that is, is if, if somebody develops Parkinson or cancer or multiple sclerosis and then gets depressed or anxious, they, they don't have a high goal of being depressed and anxious. Most of them want to recover because they want to make the most of, of of their life. And so if you have some powerful tools to help them overcome the depression or anxiety, they often respond really, really fast. And it's so gratifying. Uh, uh, to, to, and, and the short answer is you just, I just use team therapy the way I would with any other patient. Get, just develop a daily mood log. What is the event that's upsetting you? Then circle your negative feelings and rate how strong each one is from zero to 100. And then write down your, your, your negative thoughts. And you'll find that the, the negative thoughts have all the same distortions as, as someone without a medical illness. And when they uh, challenge or crush the negative thoughts, they, they suddenly, suddenly recover. I'll give you a couple quick quick examples, but also, yeah. I mean, we had a beautiful podcast on this that we can put the link to it. The, uh, you, you know, the, the live therapy with Marilyn, uh, a dear a colleague who uh, went to her yeah. doctor and was told she had stage four lung cancer and she'd never smoked. And she, she was, she was devastated. And if you listen to that, that podcast, which is a, one of our most beautiful podcasts ever, in my opinion, you'll, you'll see exactly how how we work with somebody who has a severe medical illness For, as, as well as uh, depression anxiety in her case also intense anger yeah for people who want to to listen to it um uh, they start on episode 49 oh okay so 49 50 and 51 are live session and uh on uh, episode 52 also talks about uh, people's responses to that which also were tremendous and then we had a, a follow-up, a tune-up session eight week later, uh, episode 59. So people can really get a, a good download of how to work with uh, critical illnesses. Yes, right. And then just to give two quick examples, uh, uh, when I was in Philadelphia, a, a, a salesman came to me, uh, referred by a neurologist because he had multiple uh, sclerosis. And he was intensely anxious, so he was referred to me for treatment. He's a really nice guy, and uh, when I when I had him fill out his daily mood log, the upsetting event was, you know, being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and uh, and that that that's a, a disease of the central nervous system, and sometimes I think spinal cord as well, where you get patches of demyelination. Uh, where, where the, in, in other words, the nerves in a small area yeah. will stop functioning, and, and yeah. so you get uh, you can get dizziness, you can get problems with with motor strength or or numbness, uh, and mm -hmm. and the, the, the typically the the symptoms come and then they disappear and then they'll they'll return. It, it kind of 
comes and goes, but it is it, it is can serious. lead to paralysis. I mean, it's it's yeah, various various kinds of kinds of symptoms, and um, and and he was like a hunter on the zero to hundred on on anxiety among other feelings, and he had shame and depression and discouragement and all of that. But <clears throat> what it really amounted to is he had the negative thought that he he might uh, stumble and fall at work. Yeah. Uh, because he sometimes got dizzy and and and, and stumbled, uh, that was one of his symptoms. And and then I said, if, if if suppose that happened, why is that upsetting to you? And then what it came down to is then then my colleagues will look down on me. Uh, and he was in a form of sales where they have annual sales meetings, and you've got to be number one. And it was all very macho. You're supposed to be strong and have it all together. Mm-hmm. And so he was afraid then if he was weak, his colleagues would, would, would reject him. And of course, that's a typical, uh, distortion that, that you see in anyone who has a social anxiety, which, which is mind, mind reading. And fortune telling. Yeah. And fortune telling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and also emotional reasoning. I feel defective, so I must be defective. Uh, and, and also self-blame. If they should reject me, that means that I'm, it's my fault and that I'm a loser and that I, that I'm not, not good enough. And so this is just a very simple, typical, in those days, you know, cognitive therapy case. And, and we used a variety of, of techniques, but the one that was really killer that was just, blew everything out of the water. He agreed, although he was anxious to do it, to tell his colleagues that survey he Survey technique? Yeah, yeah, survey technique, because he'd been hiding it out mm-hmm. of shame. And and to ask them what you know what, what they thought of him and, and said and asked him, you know, if I were to stumble and fall, what what would you think of me? And this was very difficult for him to do. It was very terrifying. And then as you might expect he, he got a, an outpouring of warmth and, and support from his yeah. colleagues and, and his anxiety suddenly, suddenly disappeared. Mm-hmm. And, and the take home message here, which was the same with, with, with Marilyn and her, her lung cancer, it's not the illness that upsets you. It's not the external event, or in this case, perhaps an internal medical event that upsets you. It's your thoughts about it. And those thoughts will, always be distorted and illogical if you're depressed and anxious. And when you challenge them and put the light of them, the anxiety will disappear. Now, it could, you could still be very justified in, in having some sadness if you had multiple uh, sclerosis, but that's not the same as having depression and panic and anxiety and feeling, f- f- feeling, feeling worthless. And I could give other examples of this, but I, but I won't. It's just that Every patient I've ever had who I've treated with with these these kinds of issues uh, ha- has been really easy and very gratifying to to treat. Now, one of my students, who if anyone wrote, read my book Feeling Good, you might remember Sterling Morey, the medical oh, yes. stu- student from England. Yeah, and he worked with me. I've and- never met him, nor have I, you know, read anything by him. But just the way you describe him is just uh, so endearing. So. Oh yeah, he, he he's the same way now. He's he's just really awesome. Of course, now he's a prominent and an older fellow like like myself and a leading a leading a cognitive therapist in in England. But uh, he wrote a book on cognitive behavior therapy for people with cancer. Yeah, he we, he was very interested. We did a lot of work together in this in this area. And I see now you can get that uh, uh, on, on Amazon. Before the days of Amazon, it was impossible to get it. Mm-hmm. But you can order it, and I'll put the link to, to, to that book for anyone who wants nice. to, yeah. uh, to read about that. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Mark, who's asking us, how can I help a depressed family member or friend who is passive and doesn't want to do anything? I think we've had a question kind of like that before, but uh, it, yeah, it's worth we, repeating. Yeah, we have. I don't know. If, I don't think it was this exact question. This no, was, was no. But Mark, who is a great friend of Team CBT, so he's actually a famous neuroscientist who's come out from the East Coast to visit our our Tuesday group and Sunday hikes on I think about five occasions now, and he's really a neat guy. And he did podcast number one hundred. Yeah, we we did a podcast <coughs> with him. Yeah. Um, and, but the short answer to, to this, and maybe you can embellish it, uh, is, is that 
I think in the role of a family member, uh, attempts to help or cajole the person will kind of force them to, to continue to be passive and, mm-hmm. and to, re- to resist. And I think you need to let your ego die as a family member, the, this idea that you're supposed to rescue or save this person and, and instead use the five secrets of effective communication to to provide warmth and understanding and, and be a good listener so the other person can kind of share their feelings and spill their guts and, 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 and show where their heart is at without feeling like they're being told to do something or criticized or, or put down. Now that's easier, easier said than done because it's hard to learn the five secrets and, and, uh, listeners who, who would want to, to learn that can li- listen to our podcasts on how to do the five secrets of effective communication. But it also involves an internal change in, in the person. To, to give up this idea that it, that your, your job to rescue the, the, this, this person and that it can be very hard for some people to let, to let go of, of that, uh, of that, uh, role, to give yourself that role of the, of the helper or rescuer. Yeah. And maybe you can embellish this a little bit. Well, to begin with, you know, don't even think, even if you're the best psychologist that you can do therapy with a family member, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, I've unfortunately not put myself in that situation, but um, there's there's too much enmeshment. I mean, there, there's a lot of history with your family members, and, and you can't get around that. Well, I love what you're saying, and so the idea that as a family member, then your role is just to listen and to support. Yeah. And you can ask the person, "Is this something that that you'd want some some help with?" Yeah, and and then maybe give them some tips. One thing you you could do is to to give them a copy of my book, "Feeling Good: The New Mood Therapy," because. Yeah. A good more than fifty percent of the people that are given a copy of the book, you know, re- improve or recover within four weeks. So that that's something else that that that, that you could that you can do for for sure. Uh, you want to make a word or two about enmesh- en- enmeshment and and say why that would sabotage, you know, a family member f- giving help to a family member or treating a family member. Well, so you know, as a family member. You have a vested interest in whether the other person is or isn't depressed. And so you cannot be neutral. You cannot, I mean, you can if, if you try, but really you, you don't want to see your, your, your sibling or your spouse or your child be in that situation. And so you, 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 you're trying to help and you're not going to be doing uh, a good, you cannot do good therapy if you have this need to help. That's yeah. where the enmeshment comes I, in. I love it. So you'll, you'll, you'll put them under pressure. You'll, yeah. You'll pressure yourself and, and, and them. Yeah. I mean, at the worst, uh, end of the scale would be, you know, be happy for me. Yeah. You may not say it in yeah. this way, but and there's if you're that... depressed, maybe it's a negative reflection on me. Yeah. Uh, I, like, um, I like that. What did I do to you? Um, yeah, but uh, our words might not work for some people because I've seen people who are very controlling toward their children mm-hmm. and, uh, and and have told them, you know, you need to become a better listener. And they've said things like, oh, I'm a, an, an excellent listener. I don't need any help with that. And yet they're the most controlling, demanding yeah. per- person imaginable. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other side of the ledger, I, I was successful. I colleague drove drove me to an airport after a recent workshop and and said that she was very overly controlling toward her daughter her grown daughter mm-hmm. and always trying to you know tell her daughter what to do and you've got to do this and you've got to do that and we just kind of talked about it in the car a little bit and then she actually called her daughter while we were in the car mm. who was on the other side of the country and had a little dialogue and and she said after that she just stopped trying to control her daughter and the relationship improved a lot so there is there is yeah. helping and the daughter yeah. in this case was just a very lovely young young woman and it just wasn't doing everything her mother wanted her to be doing. Yeah. So the short answer is just listen. Yeah. Yeah, learn how to listen. Yeah. And and if you want to learn how to listen read my book Feeling Good Together if you want to master the the, the five secrets that would be a, a way to to learn how to do it. Of course Mark who asked the question is very good with the five secrets. Yeah. 
Uh, I have a question from Paul, who's asking us, uh, how can I get over death anxiety? So it goes even beyond illness here. Yeah, well, uh, on, on death anxiety... Uh, and by the way, this can come at any age. I have a 25-year-old who has death anxiety. Yeah, there there's two different ways that, that I approach it. And I'll, I'll be a little brief because I'm a little close to losing my voice. But uh, one thing is that when people are afraid of death, they're, they're, they're often afraid of something else that's going on in their life. There's something mm -hmm. like they're mad at somebody or there's a conflict about school or the job and they're kind of sweeping it under the, the rug and then, oh, I'm so afraid of death. But there really is some, often some other thing. That That's, of course, the, the hidden emotion model that we've talked about in, yeah. in previous uh previous podcasts. And then there, there's the technique that I developed to get over the fear of death. And I know I did this on someone else's podcast, but did we ever do a podcast on overcoming the fear of death? I don't think that you and I did. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how it works then, because it, it's really interesting. And it, it's, I've only, first place, Irv Yalom says, I think he's, I've heard that he claims that the fear of death is the core psychological problem behind a whole lot of depression and anxiety well, is it, that true or? it it's a, it's a common um idea in uh, existential therapy yeah. yeah and he's an existential yeah. uh, therapist and uh, personally i haven't had that experience i've only uh, seen i would say uh, in my whole career three or four patients came to me with the fear of death now I'm ignoring panic disorder patients who have the fear that they're going to die of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. That That's treated d differently, and we've had podcasts on that. That's real easy to treat. But I mean just people with the ex existential fear of death. And the way I do it, and I, I might say that every time I've done this with a patient, it, it takes about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. At the end, they say, oh, that wasn't helpful at the yeah. end of the session. And then they come back the next week, and they say, I'm cured. So it's, it's, it's weird the way it works, but I say there's three things that you could be afraid of in, in the fear of death. One is you could be afraid of the moment leading up to, to the moment of death. Yeah. You could be afraid of the moment of death, or you could be afraid of the time after you're dead. Yeah. So, uh, wh 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 then I say to the patient, what, what is it that you're, which of those three are, are you afraid of? And so if they say, well, I'm afraid of uh, the moment leading up to death. Then I would say, well, that's life. That's not death. And what is yeah. it you're afraid of? And yeah. maybe you're afraid of pain. Well, we have, you know, good pain medicines. And and uh, maybe I'm afraid of, uh, you know, saying goodbye to, to, to a loved one. Well, you know, is that something you know how to do? And can you share your feelings and, mm -hmm. and, and, and your love and blah, 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 and get them to see you know, that that's not the fear of death, it's the fear of life, and those are problems that can generally be solved very, yeah. very well. Then if they say, well, it's the moment of death, I say, well, actually, that's just what happens to you every night when you go to sleep. Are you afraid of going to sleep? No, I'm not. Well, then there's nothing to be afraid of mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Then if they say, well, it's actually the time after I'm dead, I'm afraid of, and I say, well, there's two possibilities here. There will be something or nothing after you die. Yeah. If there's nothing, you have nothing to be afraid of. Right. And if there's something, you can thank your lucky stars <laughs> that there's well, an afterlife, and whatever comes up there, you can deal with it. And if you yeah. learn TV, Team CBT, you'll have some great <laughs> skills. <laughs> so uh, I go through through that, and, and they say, oh, that's just too intellectual for me. This is too rational. And then, as they say, then they come back and say, "No, it, it worked." And I've never had someone that that didn't work for. I, I think that sometimes the fear of death is this anticipatory grief, meaning mm -hmm. you haven't lost life yet, but you're projecting yourself into a future where you have lost life, and even though then you will not gr be grieving, yeah, you're grieving in advance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also I asked John Rush once about uh, about this. He he was one of the early cognitive therapists uh -huh. and became biological in, mainly in his career. But he was one of my classmates at uh, at Penn in my residency class. Mm -hmm. And I said, how 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 do you get over help someone who 
it says well, when I, this isn't the fear of death, but in, as I get older, I'll 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 regret all all the things that I haven't done. Mm-hmm. And how how would you talk back to that negative thought? And he said, oh well, uh, you you can th- number one, you could think about all the things that you have done. And then you can also ask yourself, you know, you've done some of the things you want to do in your life, but you haven't done all of the things you wanted to do in your life. What what percentage would be satisfactory for you? How many things would you have to do to feel happy, happy and fulfilled? And yeah. I thought, oh yeah, that that's a good point. There's tons of things that I haven't done, and I'm never going to do them. And I don't really give a shit. (laughs) I don't mean to be crude. I shouldn't have said that. I'm not supposed to use that word. Mm -hmm. I apologize. But it's, you know, when you think about it, how many things do you have to to do to have had a fulfilling life? But I can point to one thing that I've done. Yes. When our little black kitty, Misty, comes up and I pet her, she turns over on her back and she exposes her tummy and I start stroking it. I'm on the bed, and she's next to me, and she starts purring and squeaking. It's the most beautiful thing in the world, and that's something I can look look back yeah. on. Yeah. Well, we could have a whole show on regrets, I think. Um, next one is from Suna, um, and I don't know if it's a he or a she. Asked, I think it's a she, but I'm not sure. How can you distinguish shyness from a personality disorder such as avoidant personality disorder. And we're going to do a show for her and for this other guy, Dan, who have both experienced very severe social anxiety. We won't focus on the treatment of that now, but we're going to have two consecutive shows on how to treat social social anxiety, shyness, public speaking anxiety, yeah. stuff like that. I mean, nowadays they, they hardly dis- distinguish uh, Avoidant personality disorder and social anxiety. Well, that's that's my point Pretty exactly. The there, thing, there yeah. is no such thing as avoidant personality disorder. It's just that uh, if your shyness gets real severe, they call it avoidant personality disorder. Yeah. But there is no such such yeah. thing, and that that's the answer. But the good news is whether your shyness is mild, moderate, severe, or extreme. It, it it can be very, it's very, very treatable. It's, yeah. it's one of my favorite things to treat. Okay. Uh, here's from Sly. Do you believe in the Big Five personality traits model? And will your therapy tools change these Big, big Five traits? I got a score of 67 on neuroticism. Neuroticism. Which, neuroticism. Which means I am more prone to anger, depression, anxiety, and vulnerability and tend to think about things in a pessimistic way. If I do the exercises in your books and develop a more realistic outlook on myself and others, does it follow that my, quote, personality traits will get more or less changed? Well, the answer to that is yes. So does that mean that those are not personality traits? Yeah, there's no such thing as, as, you know, a personality trait. That's just an imaginary construct, once again. <clears throat> but the, this fellow Sly uh, sounds like he's more prone to 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 depression and and uh, anger and anxiety and vulnerability, and fifty percent of the population is more than average in these areas, mm-hmm. and 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 that just means you have more depression or more more anger, and then you use the techniques in, in, in the book, a daily mood log, and what is the focus on one moment when you're upset, not some non-existent personality trait, but the moment that you were angry or depressed, and, and, and then circle circle your emotions. What was the event, and what are your negative thoughts? And then you can do positive reframing, and uh, you do a recovery circle, and use all these techniques to, 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 crush, to crush those thoughts. I always work through specificity. I don't try to work on this, this, this general level, because you, you tend to, to spin your, your wheels. I don't know if I've said enough on this, but maybe you can put in your own thinking here, Fabrice. Well, my, my question is, are you saying that the, the big five personality traits uh, are not valid? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of usefulness. Uh, the validity would be how you would evaluate a psychological test, and that's more yeah. of a statistical concept. But I don't find the concept neuroticism uh, help, helpful. 
I, I like specific terms like depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. feeling ashamed, fe feeling angry. What's the moment when you were feeling these things? And let let show you how to to turn that or turn how, that around. How about the other factors in the in the? Model? I was going to look them up on Google. To, I don't even remember what they are. So they're. Uh, you, you can remember then by using the acronym OCEAN. Oh. So uh, O is for openness to experience. C is for conscientiousness. Contentiousness? Conscientiousness. Oh, conscientious, C. It's the opposite of procrastination, essentially. Oh, okay. Um, e is for extroversion. Mm -hmm. um, a is for agreeableness. And N is what uh, slide described uh, neuroticism. Okay. Well, it can be fun to take uh, t tests like 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 that uh, uh, and kind of kind of see how you score. But I wouldn't think think of it as too much more than kind of a parlor game, personally. Mm -hmm. So but you don't it, think it's, it's, it's useful, fun, huh? huh? You don't think it's useful. It wouldn't be useful for me. Yeah, I, don't, okay. I don't. I mean, I don't have any use for it. But somebody could find it fun and useful. Okay. All right. This is from Heike, who's asking, what if you've battled your negative thoughts and self-defeating beliefs and it still does, and still don't feel happy? An absence of depression and anxiety does not necessarily mean more joy in life. How can you help people find out where they want to go in life, who they want to be, and what it is that brings them happiness? Well, that's a beautiful question and beautifully expressed. And we appreciate all of these, these questions that that you folks submit to us. And I might say we've got another file filled with f fabulous qu questions. We, we've got an abundance of, of riches there and should be able to get some good future Ask ask Davids or Ask David and Fabrice. Yeah, keep but, asking your questions. But there's two answers that I have to, to this. First of all, most people who have battled, say I've battled negative thoughts and self-defeating beliefs and still don't feel happy, it's because they haven't successfully crushed their negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. When you, you you can be using you know cognitive techniques or techniques from a variety of schools of therapy and, and still have the belief that you're bad, that you're not good enough, that you, you know that people are going to reject you, uh, people are going to judge you, whatever your your negative thoughts happen to be. And, and so the first thing I would think of w with a person is, you know, let, let, let's take a look at your daily mood logs and let, let's see if you've really crushed your negative thoughts and brought them to zero and all of your negative thoughts, feelings, depression and shame and anger and everything have, have gone to zero because this sounds to me like incomplete uh, tr treatment. So that would be point number one. Now, uh, point number two, to take it in a slightly different direction, then I want to get your, your feedback on this, Fabrice, is, is, is that it is absolutely true that the absence of depression doesn't mean the presence of, of great joy. Now, in my clinical work, usually when people's depression scores go all the way to zero and all, and they've crushed all of their negative thoughts, they do go into a euphoric state. They do get, experience great joy. But it is theoretically possible to, to have your depression go down to a very low level and still not feel happy. And that's why on the Brief Mood Survey, we have, and I have a new version of it to show you. There's a new five-item happiness test mm -hmm. that's the exact opposite of, of my depression test. Okay. And the absence of, of depression doesn't necessarily imply the, the presence of, of, of great happiness. Um, and, and so, but if, if someone says, I want more happiness, again, I would never work on, on a general level. I would never say, oh, well, here are some methods to, here's positive psychology for you, or here's how to figure out where you want to go in life. To me, all that stuff is kind of bullshit. And, and uh, I apologize for, for being a cynic. That, that's me. That's, that's how I operate. But what I would say to the person is, oh, well, give me a particular moment in your life that you were uh, not as happy as you would like to be. What time of day was it? Where were you? Who were you interacting with? What did they say? What did you say next? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? And, and focus in on something very, very specific. And once you solve that 
problem at that specific moment in time, uh, generally uh, the whole, the problem as a whole will, will disappear. So it's exactly the same method that I use for, for helping people get over depression or yeah. panic or anger or shame or loneliness or, 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 or anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, this, this really speaks to the fact that, uh, happiness or misery is happening in the moment. Yes. It's not happening yesterday, it's not happening tomorrow, it's happening now. Yes, right. And if you look at what's happening now, and if you can solve the now, you can solve every moment of your life. Well, I just love what you're saying. And and there will always be something that the person isn't attending to. You, you, you see, maybe they're unhappy in their job, and they need to make a decision of applying for work elsewhere or discussing with their boss, the fact that they haven't had a raise in some time, some time, or they're unhappy with something in their life, they're conflicted, they want a date, but they're afraid of, you know, they're shy and they're afraid of rejection. There will always be some specific thing that they're, that they're unhappy about. And as you mm-hmm. say, once you show them how to solve that problem, the whole system of unhappiness will t- tend to fall apart. Yeah. And they will find out then what their goals are in life. They'll find by solving that one one minute because everything is encapsulated yeah. in that one moment. Yeah. Well, that's that's that sounds like a good answer to me. Ask David. And yes, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns's website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this podcast under the blog page and where you can leave your comments and questions. The website has an abundance of resources for therapists as well as non-therapists, including books, workshops, a list of online training groups around the world, and much more. Theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Fabrice Nye, and I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. 